Psalmist asks, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. We begin this morning by singing together a version of that psalm, number 24b in our books. 24b, the earth belongs to God, the world, its wealth, and all its people. And you'll see in the chorus there are letters A and B. So today let's have letter A, everybody who's on my left-hand side from the middle here, whether they're upstairs or downstairs, and your B if you're on the right-hand side here. And same downstairs. And uh, so let's sing this properly. So... When we get the A or the B, turn a little bit so you're singing to the folk on the other side and then they'll sing back to you. That's called antiphonal. That's a posh word for what we're doing, okay? So let's give it good voice, 24B. as we sit let's join our hearts together in prayer let's pray we come before you O Lord the God whose earth this is who formed it and filled it with an abundance of life and beauty and glory to display your greatness and your goodness and your beauty Above all to us men, that we might glimpse something of the wonder of the one in whose image we're made. Made to show your gracious and loving and pure and faithful heart to this whole creation. To show the whole realms of heaven and earth the true beauty of their king. 
how far we have fallen, how deeply we have disappointed and marred the name and the honor of you, the one who brought us to life from nothing but dust. You are the King of glory, the Lord of hosts, the Lord strong and mighty. And we, well, our hands are not clean and our hearts are not pure. How then can we draw near to the place where you dwell? And yet you have called us to seek your face. You have shown us grace and mercy in abundance that we might, as the psalmist said, receive blessing and receive righteousness from you, our God and our Savior, the God of our salvation. And so, Lord, with humble joy and with contrite hearts, we gather this morning as the people of your name. We gather to truly seek your face. Turn to us, we pray, O oh Lord, that the light of your gracious countenance might indeed flood our souls afresh with a life that only you can give us and which we so desperately need. And so, Almighty God, who alone canst order the unruly wills and affections of sinful men, grant unto thy people that they may love the thing which thou commandest and desire that which thou dost promise, that so among the sundry and manifold changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, a very warm, warm welcome to uh, all of you this morning, upstairs or downstairs. We're delighted to welcome you to the Fellowship of the Tron Church, very especially if you're visiting with us. And uh, if it's your first time, uh, let me say that you are very welcome indeed. There uh, will be opportunity, I hope, after the service to uh, meet and greet one another. And I hope that uh, you'll do that. But uh, just let me draw your attention to one or two notices. You have a sheet like this, uh, I think, in your... Uh, hand or in your seat or somewhere around, uh, you'll see if you open it up that in the middle there are details of all the different things going on this week. Uh, on Wednesday you'll see in the evening we have small groups. Some meet in homes, some meet uh, centrally here uh, at seven o'clock in, in Bar Street here. And uh, if you're quite new to us, if you've not been involved in one of these uh, small groups before, let me encourage you to think about that. If you'd like to just turn up here on Wednesday at seven, uh, we will very happily help you to join in one of the groups here, or if you'd like to find out more about groups that might be meeting uh, nearer where you live, uh, please do ask me or one of the uh, folks on duty after the service. Uh, we'd be delighted to try and help you uh, find your way into those. It's a, an important way when we're a congregation that live all over the city uh, to meet together, to encourage one another, and to share real Christian fellowship together uh, beyond just uh, what we do on Sundays. Lots of other different meetings there, you'll see. Some of them uh, may be of interest to you. And uh, again, if you'd like to know more, please just ask or there are email details there. You can email the church office and uh, they'd be glad to give you uh, further information. But uh, I'll let you read the rest of these at your leisure. Please do keep them. Use these to remind us all that's going on so that we can unite our hearts in prayer together for all the work going on uh, throughout the week in the life of the church. But uh, we're going to turn to our Bible reading now, and you'll find that in our church Bibles on page 810 in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. And we're continuing our studies uh, after a couple of weeks' break in the Sermon on the Mount, looking very particularly this morning at two of these six paragraphs in Matthew 5, 27 to 30, and 38 to 42, but we're going to read most of the chapter, just missing out the middle section. So let me start at Matthew 5 and verse uh, 20. 
Jesus says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser stand over you, uh, hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, or better, who looks at a woman in order to, to covet her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. We pick up at verse 38. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles, the pagans, do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Amen. May God bless to us his word. Well, we sing now a hymn that picks up that very theme, number 806 in our blue books. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see their God. The secret of the Lord is theirs, their soul is Christ's abode. Number 806.
Well, now our offerings will be received, and uh, as the offerings are taken up, the musicians will play quietly. It's an opportunity for us to read and meditate again upon these words that we'll be studying shortly, or perhaps just to be quietly in prayer for those in need at this time. But as we do that, our offerings are received. This world and this earth belongs to God, the world, its wealth, and all its people. He it is who formed it, he it is who owns it, he it is who will judge it. We thank you, Lord, for this reminder, timely as it is from your word, of who it is who truly rules this earth. In a day when we are bombarded constantly with the voices and the words of those who claim to be leaders of the world, strutting its stage, making their pronouncements, telling us what we should think and do, telling us that they have the power, whether it be leaders in Europe or America or the Far East, the prevailing powers or the rising powers. We're surrounded by men who think that the rule of this world is theirs, pontificating on matters of economics, and politics, and sovereignty, speaking even as though they could decide and choose what temperature this world will be. Remind us, O oh God, we pray, to humble ourselves. Remind us that it is you who raises up kings and rulers and who casts them down. And turn our eyes, we pray, to the place of true authority to the sovereign power that can never be shaken and to the throne 
which rules forever this and every world. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that by your grace and your mercy alone, you have opened our eyes and the eyes of our hearts to the truth that lies above and beyond and all around this visible world that we can see. We thank you that we have the confidence of knowing you, the ruler of all, and that we have the access to you by the privilege of prayer that as children to a father we might come to you and bring our cares and our concerns, asking you for help in the areas where we do not even know how to ask or what to ask, but simply we see and we know there is such great need for righteousness, for peace, for heaven's purity to be seen infecting and touching and changing this world so impure, so tainted with sin, with ambition, with the arrogance and the folly of human beings. Remember our world, O God. Have mercy upon us in these days. As a nation we live in, changing times in the flux and uncertainty of coming elections, both in May here in Scotland and then in the European referendum in June. There are so many uncertainties, so many different parties, policies, people vying for our attention, vying for our votes and approval. Have mercy on us, we pray, O God. Guard us from all that is foolish, all that is wrong. We have the privilege of democracy and therefore we get the governments that we vote for. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Grant by your mercy that we should be ruled by those better than we deserve. In these days of flux and change and such uncertainty, we do give you thanks very especially this week for the strength and stability brought to our nation by Her Majesty the Queen in this, the week of her 90th birthday. How we thank you, Lord, for her strength, for her stature, above all, for her true Christian faith, which has surely suffused every aspect of her reign and has been the cause of so much of her great and gracious influence, not only in this nation and throughout the Commonwealth, but all throughout the world. Bless her, we pray, and her family. Grant, we ask, above all other things, that the Christian faith that enlivens her heart and life would truly and in an extensive way enliven the lives of all of her family and especially of her heirs, not only for their sake, but for our sake and for this nation. We pray, O oh God, for your church in this land of ours that we love and that we long would be truer to your name and to your word faithful in its task, courageous in its calling to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and him alone as a great God and Savior in a world of many voices and many claims and many religions, in a nation now where it seems anything is acceptable except to honor uniquely the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we thank you, Lord, that in our own city here today, this morning, as we gather here, so also in many places there are gathering bodies of believers truly calling upon your name in truth, with expectancy, and with hearts filled with hope in your word. We pray especially this morning for the a newly established church in Tall Cross, meeting in its new premises in these early weeks 
of this change in their identity. And we thank you for them. I'd ask that you would bless them richly and encourage them and provide for their needs and give them much to rejoice in in these days of new witness for them. We think of our friends at Cross Hill thanking you for the ever greater unity and uh, joy we have in serving with them. And as we plan with them for changes in the future, we ask that you would fill their hearts with joy and bless them with us and us with them, even as they join us in our evening meetings. We thank you for our brother, Gary Brotherston, here this morning with his family with us and for that work that they are doing there in Bishop Briggs, thanking you, Lord, for the growth that you've brought to that fellowship, for the blessing that they have been to that people and to the community. And we ask, Lord, that you would refresh them in their holiday, encourage them in their labors, and bring them back to that people to further the work of Christ in that part of town. For many others, Lord, that we know and we rejoice with in this city and far beyond, we thank you for the partnerships we have, the fellowship, the sharing in the body of Christ and in the mission of Christ. And so we ask for ourselves this day that as we meet seeking your word, asking that you would search deeply our hearts. May you fit us better to be the people you would have us be and to bear the banner of our Lord Jesus Christ and to bring the grace and the love and the mercy and the purity of our Heavenly Father to this city, to our communities, and to be visible among those whom we know and love and work with and live among. So come to us, Lord, we pray. Open our hearts to you this morning. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we continue in prayer then as we sing the words of our version of the Lord's Prayer, our Father God who dwells in heaven.
Well, if you take up your Bible at uh, Matthew chapter 5, uh, page 810 in the uh, Visitor's Bibles, we uh, come back today after a couple of weeks uh, break to Jesus teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, where he's teaching us the practice of true Christianity, the manners of Christ's people, so to speak, uh, taught by Jesus himself. And as we've already seen, his teaching is very radical indeed. Uh, In both senses of that word, it's very clear and searching and challenging. With that climax in verse 48, you therefore must be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Uh, It's radical in the sense of... uh, being exceptional and provocative, uh, even incendiary. Uh, But it's also truly radical in the more original sense of that word in terms of getting to the very root of the matter, the essential uh, foundational reality of what real righteousness is all about and looks like uh, as far as God himself is concerned. And what we're seeing is that, according to Jesus, the true righteousness of heaven has, in fact, very little to do with religious ceremony, but it's got a very great deal to do with right relationships. In fact, according to Jesus, it's the reality of a right relationship with God in heaven, a truly earthly relationship with heaven, that is the evidence that a person belongs to the kingdom that he has come to inaugurate. Living the life of kingdom righteousness that Jesus teaches us isn't at all about effort to to, to gain acceptance with God. No, it's evidence that you are right with God, that you know him, that you really are his, that it's he who owns you and directs your heart and your mind and your soul. You really do have a living earthly relationship with heaven and with the Father in heaven. And that real membership of his heavenly kingdom is expressed on earth as the true morality, the true ways of the kingdom of heaven are manifest through Christ's true kingdom people. In other words, where there are real earthly relationships with heaven, there will be seen even now real heavenly relationships on earth. The reality of heaven itself will be visible, will be tangible here on the earth in the right relationships that exist among God's kingdom people and between his people and the people of this world. Real heavenly relationships manifest here on earth in the real world lives of our ordinary daily existence. That's what the practice of real Christianity is all about, at least according to Jesus. And that's what the greater righteousness that Jesus speaks about here in verse 20 actually looks like. It's simply the great commandment of the law, but lived out and played out in the flesh of our lives, loving the Lord with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and our neighbor as ourselves, not just in theory, but in the cold light of day. And the the six paragraphs here, the so-called antitheses that Jesus lays out, just spell these things out in terms of a number of everyday examples. They're not exhaustive, of course. They're not meant to be, but they're signposts to show us the right direction for all of our thinking about how to live in heaven's true pattern in all of our lives. So they're not exhaustive, but actually when you start to think through what Jesus is saying, they are really pretty comprehensive. It's hard not to think of what's not encompassed by the things Jesus speaks of here. Because he talks about relationships in all of life that in every respect are radically loving and radically pure and radically faithful. Because they reflect the radical love and purity and faithfulness of heaven itself and of our Father in heaven. When you think about it, it's difficult to think what is not covered by all of these characteristics for healthy and wholesome and fruitful relationships in life. At every level, the personal level, the communal level, even the global level. And uh, as we saw last time, Matthew has very carefully arranged his material for us. He's arranged it symmetrically so as to highlight for us that Jesus really does mean for us to think about this utterly uh, comprehensively. 
He wants us to apply everything that he's saying to our thinking about both uh, our nearest and most private and most intensive relationships in life, but also uh, to the widest and most public and most extensive relationships that we have. In other words, we're to take these principles, which are the manners and the, the mores of heaven itself, and we're to apply them far and wide, high and low, to every aspect of our lives, to the nth degree, as far as we can possibly think. There to be no limits to the length and the breadth and the depth and the height of our love and our purity and our faithfulness. That's what he's saying. Now, we are to be those who express here on earth the limitless, all-embracing, expansive character of our Father in heaven. And we're to reflect his love, his purity, his faithfulness in this world and in our lives. Verse 48, be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect in all these ways. That's the practice of the true Christian disciple. That's the manners of Christ's true people. And so last time we saw that uh, our relationships are to be radically loving. They're to reflect heaven's radical love. Not only radically loving within the Christian community, that's what verses 21 to 26 describe, but also verses 43 to 48, radically loving to those outside, extending even to those who are our sworn personal enemies. Just like our Heavenly Father who blesses this hostile world, this rebellious world with sunshine and rain and all the things to sustain life. And who sent his only son to us. That while we were still enemies, he might die for us in order to make us his friends. What a very great challenge there is there, isn't there, for all of us. And yet we're simply being told that we are to live out on this earth the manners of our true family in heaven. And to show the name into which we've been called, the name of our own heavenly father. And so it is with this next pair of antitheses that I want to look at this morning in these two matching paragraphs, verses 27 to 30 and verses 38 to 42. Uh, if you weren't here a couple of weeks ago and got the, um, the, the handout with the, uh, showing the, the, the way this uh, chapter is set out, then I think there should be some at the doors. You can pick one up uh, afterwards. But these two paragraphs belong together. And they speak clearly of how we are to also reflect in all things heaven's radical purity. Jesus tells us that if our relationships on earth are to truly reflect heavenly relationships, then they must be radically pure, both in our personal private lives, they must be pure inwardly, and also in our public shared lives, they must be pure outwardly. So look first at verses 27 to 30. They're all about radically pure relationships inwardly. Jesus is saying that, that kingdom righteousness is expressed by radical inward purity in our personal and private lives, even in the hidden world of our thoughts and our desires and our imagination. Verse 27, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, if we just take verse 27, I suppose most of us think about that rather like we do about the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. That was mentioned in verse 21. Well, here's the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. Now, some of us here this morning probably will have committed adultery, of course. But I expect most of us think, well, I never have, and I'm sure I never will, so I'm not an adulterer. And maybe you feel a little bit um, superior about that. If I just said there a moment ago, some here will have committed adultery, you thought, oh, well, not me. And you feel a bit uh, superior. That's what many of Jesus' hearers thought too. Many of the scribes and the Pharisees certainly felt that their consciences were totally clear on this matter. But you see, one of the things that they had done was to so domesticate God's commandments, to so hedge them in, they had made divorce so very easy. So that actually there was no need for them to officially commit adultery as such. You could just get rid of the wife that you didn't want anymore, the one who you felt didn't meet your sexual needs. 
getting a bit boring or whatever it was. So you divorced them with all the very correct and proper paperwork, of course, everything done to the letter of the law. And then you got a different woman, the one that you wanted now. And the Henry VIII approach to marriage and divorce. You find a nice legal way to annul your marriage. And hey, presto, you get your new sexual partner. And what do you know? God and the church is still on your side. Well, in Henry's case, he made himself the head of the church, so he could interpret exactly how it was uh, decided. But in the Pharisees' case, what they had done was just to make a, a complex web of interpretations and loopholes, essentially, in God's law, but for exactly the same purpose, to get what they wanted to satisfy their desires. And, of course, that's what many, many professing Christians still do today, rationalizing God's word to justify their desires, to get what they want. And at the same time to convince themselves, of course, that actually God still fully approves of what they're doing. And of course, in our culture today, that is very particularly so, isn't it, in this whole realm of sexual relationships. But Jesus says, if you think like that, you expose yourself as a fool. You've totally missed the point of God's command for purity. It's not just the final outward act that he's concerned with. God's command is a signpost that points all the way in to the very depth of your private and personal world where nobody else can see, but God can see everything. The thinking and ruminating about gaining an illicit sexual fulfillment with another. The fantasies about what you like to do in trying to take what's not yours to have and is not right to do. And all these things, you see, expose the idolatry of a deeply divided heart, a heart that professes to love and worship God, but actually deep down worships, well, not just sex, but worships self. And it's that deep-rooted heart idolatry that leads to all coveting, to all stealing, to all idolatry of all kinds. It's what comes from the heart that defiles us, says Jesus, later on in Matthew 15. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander, all those final acts that the Ten Commandments condemn. And so anyone who has ever in the privacy of their own hearts nurtured sinful thoughts like that has, says Jesus, already done the deed in your heart. And adultery, he's saying, like every other sinful act, is at root a matter of the heart. I think it's important to say something here about what Jesus is saying and isn't saying. Jesus is not saying, as people often think, that sinfully lustful thoughts are just exactly the same as the act of adultery itself, as though one is no worse than the other. So that you could say, well, we've all thought like that, and we're all guilty of adultery, so we might as well do the thing as well and get the full bang for the buck. Well, that's just foolish, isn't it, as saying, oh, well, we've all been angry, so we might as well all just go the full whack and murder the person we don't like. It's all the same. We're all still guilty. No, that's just stupid. That's, that's not taking Jesus seriously at all here. Jesus is talking about something quite different. And he's not either talking about just looking at a woman lustfully. That's how the, the, the NIV translates it. As if He's not saying as if any feeling of attraction or any feeling of sexual arousal towards a woman is evil in and of itself. That can't be so. The Bible's clear that, that sexual attraction and sexual appetite is part of our makeup. It's the way God has made us to be attracted uh, to the opposite sex. It's not the manner of looking that he's talking about. As if there was a sexual way of looking and an utterly platonic way of looking. He's assuming in what he says that a man will be sexually attracted to a woman. No, what he is homing in on is the purpose of that look. The intent, as the ESV says here. Literally, it would be better to read, whoever looks at a woman in order to lust for her, or even better, in order to covet her. 
is already committing adultery in his heart. The word lust here means desire. It means to long for. It means to set your heart on, to covet. It's not necessarily a a negative desire or else Jesus himself lusts. Uh, In Luke 22, verse 15, he says himself, I have earnestly desired, same word, to eat this Passover with you. In Matthew 13, verse 17, Jesus says, many righteous people and prophets have longed, lusted, coveted, to see what you see and didn't see. It's not necessarily negative, but very often it is translated as a covetous desire. And it's precisely the word that in the Greek Old Testament is used in the 10th commandment. You shall not covet, you shall not desire, you shall not set your heart upon your neighbor's wife or servant or anything else. Paul uses the same word in Romans 7.7 7 and in Romans 13.9 when he's quoting from the Decalogue. I wouldn't have known what it was to covet, to lust, unless the law had said you shall not desire in that way. And that's exactly the context here that Jesus is using this word in, isn't it? In fact, I don't think he's saying anything new at all. He's rather reminding his hearers that the seventh commandment about adultery, just like every other commandment, is intimately linked with the tenth commandment not to covet because it's in the heart it's in the covetous heart the self-worshipping heart that every other evil is conceived and nurtured and fed until at last out of the heart comes the end results of the reactions of wickedness, the things that are just simply bringing to light in the end, the evil and the darkness that's long been present, just been hidden away in the heart. And it's that nurturing of evil in the heart as already a very real challenge to God's commandment for purity. It's that that Jesus has in view here. He's getting to the root of what motivates our actions, even our looking. We're not to look in order to covet something that is clearly wrong, something that's clearly forbidden for us to have. In fact, it's just exactly like in chapter 6, verse 1, where Jesus says we're to be aware of even practicing our righteous good deeds before other people in order to be seen by them. You see, he's talking about corrupt and sinful motivations and purposes in our hearts. And these things can corrupt a person and corrupt even things that might be good in themselves, like doing righteous deeds or like looking at and appreciating a beautiful woman's qualities. And here you see that corrupt motivation is harboring a desire for an illicit sexual union, a relationship that God has forbidden. Just as the 10th commandment says we mustn't covet the wife of another or need any such union that God's word firmly forbids. We must not harbor that desire or think about how we can satisfy that desire. It may actually be in verse 28 that this phrase should be translated as looking at a woman in order to make her covet or desire you. I'm not sure, but Don Carson says that that might very well be a better translation, in which case what's in view is a, a, an illicit seduction in which both parties then become part of that sin. And that might make sense of the uh, specific reference in verse 28 to committing adultery with her uh, in his heart as though both are involved. But either way, what's in view is not simply seeing an attractive member of the opposite sex and feeling a rush of attraction or even feeling a rush of arousal. Goodness, it's only an anesthetized man who will never feel that at some times. The Lord's not being ridiculously unrealistic here. No, what he is speaking about is letting a natural desire and appetite which can be strong and passionate and not necessarily sinful in itself but letting that desire become corrupted. Corrupted by selfish and sinful hearts so that you nurture thoughts about how indeed you might indulge that desire for forbidden fruit. Even though you know God has said, no, from that tree you must not eat. And you see, when I put it in those words, You can see how basic this is and how it takes us right to the very root of every single sinful act and behavior, right back to the very beginning. 
Genesis 3, 6. Eve saw that the tree was good for fruit and that it was a delight to the eyes and to be desired to make one wise. And so she took and ate. Began where? In the heart and with the eyes. She could have looked at the tree and, and praised its beauty and its delights and said, what a beautiful, wonderful, desirable tree. But of course, it can't be for me to indulge my appetites because God has forbidden that for me. But no, she didn't. Just as I think a normal red-blooded male doesn't need to beat himself up because he has a sex drive and because he finds certain women particularly dressed in certain ways make him feel rather hot under the collar. No, that's not what Jesus is hitting at here. But he is warning us and he is warning us very clearly that sin will corrupt every single desire we find in our hearts. And he is warning us that adultery, just like murder, begins and is fundamentally something rooted in the heart, in our minds, in our thoughts, in our will, in the, in the nerve center of our being. That's what the heart means in the Bible. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, all the things that defile us, all the things that make us impure in the sight of God. And so we must guard our hearts, says Jesus, because according to him, the sin that is, that is conceived there, the sin that is nurtured there, deep and hidden within, that can lead us to hell itself. And so it's radical heart surgery that we need to save us if we are to be those who can enter his heavenly kingdom. Don't think that just keeping your hands clean is enough, avoiding the full monte, not doing the final thing. What does the psalmist say? Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall enter his presence? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. It's the heart that harbors sin. And Jesus says, that can take you to hell. Christ's apostles speak as one on this, friends. We must be real. James 1 verse 14. Each is tempted when he is lured by his own desire, covetous lust, same word. The desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And Paul likewise warns the Corinthian church, doesn't he? Not to have desires, covet evil, especially in sexual immorality, as the people of Israel did and were judged by God. What does he say to the Colossians? Put to death. Whatever is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, anti-worship of God, worship of self. All these heart desires are idolatry. Worship not of God, but of ourselves, of our own egos and covetous desires. And Jesus says, just as Paul says, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Is Paul an extremist? That's what we hear all around today, isn't it? Especially in the debates about sexuality. Ignore Paul. Let's get back to Jesus. Friends, Jesus gave it to Paul. Look how serious Jesus is here in verses 29 and 30 about these private matters of our heart. These can be deadly, he says. If you don't act radically, look where it's going to end. Look at the last word of each verse here, verse 29. It ends in hell. Verse 30, it ends in hell. That's where impurity in the heart will always end up, according to Jesus, if there is not real and radical repentance. In other words, radical and vicious destruction of this impurity, this idolatry. Friends, this is a critical issue for us in our day, isn't it? Not just for most of us, and certainly speaking for men, I think for all of us, because we live in a sex-mad society. There's temptation everywhere, around every corner. Not as it was when those of an older generation were growing up, not just films and TV. It's everywhere, on our computers, on our phones. And this secular world of ours is, 
is just starting to recognize the problems, isn't it? If you've been listening to the news this week, there's been so much, hasn't there, about problems of sexual violence among children, even primary school children, sexual violence in the primary school. But if you listen to the so-called experts on the Today program this week, you'll find that the answers they had to this problem are the very things that have caused the problem in the first place. More of that for even younger and younger children. No. We need to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. And also, before we in the church stand up and lecture the world, Jesus wants us to wise up and be real about ourselves. Because we are not immune. That's why this is in the Bible. And in our culture and in our day, we are more vulnerable perhaps than any other generation, certainly in living memory. Sinclair Ferguson says in one of his books, sexual relations have become the door through which many professing Christians have walked to their destruction. And that's sadly very true. I've seen it too many times. And so have many of you. And friends, Jesus says to us, shut that door. Walk away from that door. Do whatever you must do to stay away from that door. Better, far better to take action that seems unbelievably painful, that feels like mutilating your own body, like pulling out an eye or chopping off a hand. Far better that than endure far, far worse and endure it for all eternity in the darkness and the despair of hell itself. Better to endure the searing pain of severing a sinful relationship now, of losing part of your life that seems so vital now, than losing everything forever and ever and ever. Of course, Jesus isn't suggesting we physically mutilate ourselves. Some people have misunderstood him to mean that. That misses his whole point. His whole message is the problem lies not in the limbs, but in the heart and in the imagination deep, deep within us. And what he's saying is that all such idols in our hearts and minds must be radically ripped away, radically dismembered, destroyed. If our allegiance to the kingdom of heaven is to be real. Kingdom people express the true values of heaven in radically pure relationships inwardly. Not in the divided hearts that covet forbidden sexual gratification. But of course, selfish sexual desires are not the only sinful desires that corrupt us and make us idolatrous. And nor is it only inward purity that Jesus is concerned with. No, kingdom people must also have radically pure relationships outwardly. And that is the heart of verses 38 to 42. We've only got time very briefly to scan them. But you'll see that this paragraph isn't so much about setting your heart on uh, and desiring covetously things you don't have, things that aren't yours, things that should not be yours in terms of sexual gratification. But they're about worshipping and covetously grabbing hold of and idolizing what you do have already in terms of material gratification. It's all about how we react in public relationships when we find that our, our reputation or our rights or our riches are at stake. Look at verse 38. The law that's uh, expressed there, the lex talionis, the eye for an eye, uh, is called that. Law has, has its whole purpose, purity in justice. It enforced restraint as well as retribution. It limited all private revenge and retaliation in a world where vengeance could be huge and, and extensive and excessive. No, there must be no more than exact justice. No more than an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth because there's a responsibility even to the wrongdoer, even to a criminal a responsibility to them for justice. Now that is not how you feel when you've just been the victim of a crime, is it? But God says, no, you must be pure even when you have been wronged. 
The command, of course, was for the judiciary. You can read it in Deuteronomy 19. And it demanded pure justice, not personal vengeance. So Jesus is not at all saying, oh, there's to be no justice. Jesus is not saying there's to be anarchy, there's to be no police, no courts, no judges. That was the mistake Leo Tolstoy made in thinking that is what Jesus was saying. That's the mistake Gandhi really made as well, following that. As if in a, a sinful and fallen world, evil should never be punished and somehow things will all be dandy. That is just utter naivety and that is not what the Bible teaches. It's certainly not what Jesus is saying here. If you want to read later on, I recommend you read in Romans 12 and 13 and you'll see that the Apostle Paul in exactly the same breath quotes Jesus here. Don't repay evil with evil. Don't avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God. And in the very next breath, he says, but the civil magistrate, the law courts and the police and the judiciary, they are there to punish wrong. They are God's servants. And they administer God's wrath. So Jesus is not being an anarchist and neither is any of the New Testament. He's speaking to individual people here and Jesus knows the human heart. And he is saying to us, his people, not so with you. He knows that, that religion plays to the natural sinful heart. He knows that we want to tick, tick the box of the command and say, oh, we've kept that command. But actually in our hearts we're saying, well, how much evil can I get away with repaying and still be righteous? How can I get the maximum revenge and nothing bad happened to me? Well, that's how I think anyway. And I suspect some of you are like that. But Jesus says, no, don't you see that even that law is there to drive you in the opposite direction? It tells you the absolute limit of justice. But you should see that you shouldn't even need to press for that at all. In fact, you're to be a people who sees the needs of others before your rights, always. That is a constant principle, by the way, all through the law of Moses. Needs trump rights, always. So, for example, in Exodus chapter 21, in the very verse after a verse that quotes this eye for an eye principle, it speaks about the duty of a slave owner, if he has hit a slave and injured him, to let that slave go free, to forfeit his right to that man's labor because the need, even of his slave, trumps his right for labor. Same in Deuteronomy 23, when an escaped slave must be helped and welcomed. You shall not wrong him, says the Lord. His needs trump your rights. And you see, if you're a kingdom person, says Jesus, you will see that, that your responsibilities to others always overrule your prized and coveted rights, whatever the cost to you. And if that's not so, well, you're exposed as not, in fact, sharing the radical purity of heaven in your life. In fact, you're still an idolater. You say you belong to Christ's kingdom, but in your heart, you're just still lusting after all the same gratification of the things of this earthly world. And so here you see Jesus points up three areas that so easily show up our lust and what really are the things that we covet and protect and idolize in our lives. And he warns us not to do that, but to instead to exhibit heaven's radical purity. So verse 39 don't idolize your reputation, he says. A slap on the cheek in that culture was a way of giving a huge insult. And so you would go to law, you would sue to defend your honor and your reputation. Just as today, people sue for libel and slander and so on. My goodness, don't we live in a day now when we're encouraged to feel offense at virtually everything? You can hardly say a thing to anybody these days without somebody being offended and demanding an apology. We even want apologies for people, things... Things people said hundreds of years ago. And we can be infected by that mentality, don't we? You've offended me. How dare you? And Jesus says, no, don't idolize your reputation. Take the slap in the face. Which for us will be more likely a verbal one than a physical one. But Jesus says, take it and take another one too. What matters is not our honor and reputation, but Christ's and his kingdom. 
We need to show the world that we don't idolize our reputation, but that we do rejoice and honor Jesus, who calls us to the way of shame. Might well be Jesus is, is referring particularly here to the insults and the reviling that back in verse 11 he says will come to all true believers on his account. Well, if that's so, what does Peter say to us in his letter? To this we are called to follow Christ, who when he was reviled did not revile, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. The pure in heart don't idolize their own personal reputation. And don't idolize and covet your rights, verse 40 and 41. An Israelite's cloak was rather sacrosanct in the law in Exodus 22 or in, in Deuteronomy 24. It said you must return it by evening if it's taken as a pledge so that someone can sleep in it. It would be a, a humiliation to be without your cloak. It would demean your dignity for people to know that. It would be rather like... Um, us having our house repossessed and being tipped outside, a hugely embarrassing and, and humiliating thing. Well, Jesus says, be ready to even give away this and be humiliated rather than to worship and stand on your rights. Just as in verse 41, be willing to demean yourself by going not the one mile that a Roman soul had a right to demand of you, but twice what he could ask of you and what he had no right to ask and what you had every right to refuse don't stand on your rights not to go one yard more than you have to not to work one hour more than you must forgo even your rights don't jealously guard what is yours be like your heavenly father who gave and who gives even when nothing is deserved and nothing is received with thanks and so verse 42, same, don't idolize your riches either. Be open-handed and give to those who are in need because needs always matter more than your rights in God's kingdom. It's always been so. Read the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 23 and 24, Deuteronomy 15. Your corn and your grapes and so on in your field, they're yours, of course they are, but your neighbor, if he needs them, if he's starving, he can eat them. Because a hungry neighbor and his needs is more important than your right to maximum profit from your field. Says Moses, you are never to look grudgingly on your poor brother. So Jesus says, give to him who begs. Don't refuse the one who needs a loan from you. That's the way of heaven. The only limit to your giving is to be the limit of love. It's important, of course. Jesus isn't being foolish. He's not saying give constantly to every beggar who begs from you when you know fine well the first thing they're going to do is go straight off and damage themselves more by taking more drugs or whatever it is. He's not saying that, saying that any more than he's saying don't resist an evil person. That means that if you see somebody being mugged in the street, you say, oh, Jesus says don't resist an evil person. I'll walk by on the other side. Of course not. But what he is saying and it is a real challenge to all of us. He is saying, don't idolize, don't jealously guard your riches or your rights or your reputation out of love for yourself. But give generously out of love for others, a love that reflects the love of heaven and the love of your own heavenly Father who showed the extent of his love even to an enemy world by giving, 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 giving his own son. Real kingdom righteousness expresses the righteousness of the God who though rich, yet for our sake became poor, not grasping his reputation, not grasping hold of his rights, not grasping hold of the riches of heaven itself, but giving up all things for our sake. And Jesus is simply saying, so also must be the attitude of heart of every true child of this heavenly father. It's in the DNA. You see how these paragraphs are so closely related? It's because the idolatrous and covetous desire of an impure and divided heart is always expressed in, in seeking gratification, not in the things of heaven, 
but in the things of this passing world. Whether it's covetous, sinful desires of the flesh in terms of sexual gratification, or whether it's the same selfish lusts for material gratification, jealously desiring our rights, our reputation, our riches, all that we have. No, says Jesus. That can't be so for you if you're really mine. My kingdom must be radically pure with the purity of heaven itself, not a hint of idolatry. Not inwardly, not outwardly. Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He doesn't lift up his soul, his heart, to what is false, all the idols of this world. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, our Father, Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thee thy holy name. Through Christ Jesus our Lord we pray. Amen. Well, a challenge to all of our hearts. And we sing by way of response, number 834, Search me, O God, my actions try, and let my life appear as seen by your all-searching eye to mine my ways make clear. Number 834.
And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the unutterable love of our Father in heaven in the gracious presence of the Holy Spirit himself be with you all. Amen.